Today's story takes us to upstate New York in the early 1900s, where a murder was committed that was so heinous that it captured the nation's attention. Not only were these tragic events splashed over all the national newspapers, but they were retold in multiple books and movies, the most famous of which was a movie, A Place in the Sun, adapted from the book An American Tragedy. Grace May Brown was born in South Otselic, New York on March 20th, 1886, the fifth of nine children. Grace graduated from a one-room school at the age of 16. She moved to the nearby town of Cortland in 1904 to live with her sister after a brief stint as a farmhand in Norwich. Soon after the move to Cortland, Grace found work at the Gillette Skirt Factory. Here she made the acquaintance of a young, handsome socialite named Chester Ellsworth Gillette, who happened to be the owner's nephew. Gillette was originally from Montana and bounced around from place to place before his wealthy uncle took him under his wing and hired him at the skirt factory where he met Grace. Chester knew he was a catch in upstate New York. He was decidedly handsome and enjoyed the perks of his uncle's money. Grace must have been over the moon that such a desirable man took an interest in her. Unfortunately, Grace was only a notch in Chester's belt. The Gillette family was old money, and Grace was a simple but beautiful farm girl in Chester's eyes. He didn't mind having a sexual relationship with her, but he certainly wasn't going to give her the privilege of his last name. He had his eyes on a socialite named Harriet Benedict, a girl of high social standing from a wealthy New York family. And in the spring of 1906, Grace got pregnant and everything changed. The affair could not remain casual. Grace unabashedly begged Chester to marry her, but he wouldn't hear of it. She wrote letter after letter to try and help him understand the fear and shame she would experience if her family found out about the baby. Chester hardly acknowledged her, and in July 1906, Chester invited Grace to go on a trip to the Adirondacks. Grace thought this would be the wedding trip that would make her troubles go away. The plan was for Grace to meet Chester in DeRider, where they would catch a train to Utica, New York and avoid detection by friends and family. Her family bid farewell to Grace, not knowing that it would be the last goodbye. On July 11, 1906, the pair arrived at Big Moose Lake and stayed at the Glenmore Hotel under the name Carl Graham of Albany and Grace Brown of South Otselic. Robert Morrison rented a rowboat to Chester and Grace, who recalled Chester bringing a formal suitcase and tennis racket with him on the boat. Morrison found this to be unusual. When the sun set over Big Moose Lake, Chester and Grace didn't return. Initially, Robert assumed the couple misjudged the size of the lake and ended up at another resort. When they didn't come back on the second day, a search party was formed. The party searched the lake by steamboat and eventually did find the rowboat. A young boy noticed a peculiar mass at the bottom of the lake and brought it to the attention of the crew. Searchers pulled up what they believed to be debris to find it was the body of a woman. The head and chest came out of the water first. The corpse was quickly hauled on board the steamboat and hurried toward shore. The crew noticed the woman had horrible lacerations on her forehead and mouth. They immediately called the authorities. Police responded right away, and a short investigation revealed the couple to be guests at the Glenmore, registered as Carl Graham of Albany and Grace Brown of South Otselic. Searchers dragged the lake under the assumption that a dead man was in it, but turned up nothing. Upon informing the Brown family, authorities learned that Grace had not spent time with anyone named Carl Graham. She did, however, associate with Chester Gillette, and a search for Chester ensued. Two men reported encountering a strange man in the woods around the lake. 
He wore a suit and asked them how to get to Eagle Bay. Officers pursued the same wooded path and located Chester at Arrowhead Hotel, where he spent the night socializing, laughing, and even bragging about a drowning back at Big Moose Lake that was not yet reported. It was at this point Chester was placed under arrest. Doctors conducted a post-mortem examination on Grace's body, where they learned she was around four months pregnant. She was alive when her body entered the water. Before she took her last breath, Grace suffered a beating that caused terrible bruising on her face and head. Chester was asked to give a statement. He readily admitted he was with Grace when she died. Initially, he said she was despondent over the pregnancy and committed suicide. When confronted with the fact that Grace had been struck in the face and head, he told a different story. In this second story, Chester claims he stood up on the boat to reach his hat. When he did, the boat capsized and threw them both into the lake. Chester didn't attempt to help Grace. He was afraid she would panic and drag him under as well. He shouted to her to grab hold of the boat, but when she did, it turned over again and Grace went under and never resurfaced. Chester's clothing and luggage, which he claimed to have retrieved from the water, were completely dry. Chester's versions of events didn't explain why he took such an unusual path to Arrowhead Inlet, or most importantly, why didn't he bother to report the incident to anyone? Chester's sensational trial began on November 12, 1906, in Herkimer, New York. The prosecution proposed the theory that Grace's pregnancy and insistence upon marriage drove Chester to murder her, but without a confession or a witness, District Attorney Ward needed to gather as much circumstantial evidence as possible, and there was certainly no shortage of that. Ward wondered why an innocent man would check into a hotel under an alias. When Chester rented the rowboat, he had a tennis racket and suitcase in his possession. The tennis racket, according to the coroner, was used to club Grace, causing her to fall out of the boat. Grace, being unable to swim and badly hurt, was left to drown. The defense put forth the scenario that Grace was so distraught that she ended her life. Gillette testified under oath that Grace jumped in while he sat at one end of the rowboat and caused it to capsize. The defense had each of Grace's love letters to Chester read aloud. Instead of finding Grace suicidal, the court empathized with her condition. Jurors, lawyers from both sides, and Grace's family cried through the readings. Even Chester shed a tear as he listened. In the end, the jury believed the story put together by the prosecution. Chester enticed Grace into the boat with promises of a romantic day. When Chester found a private place, he beat Grace with the tennis racket, knocking her off the boat. He then made his escape through the rugged, wooded trail by the Arrowhead Lodge. He arrived there bone dry, suitcase and tennis racket in hand. The murder of Grace Brown was brutal and thoroughly premeditated. He was sentenced to death by electrocution. Upon hearing the verdict, Chester telegrammed three words to his father, I am convicted. After several failed appeals, 24-year-old Chester Gillette was executed by electrocution at Aubrey Correctional Facility on March 30th, 1908. His last words were, tell my mother I am prepared to meet my God. After the murder, it had been reported with dozens of witnesses that a spirit had been seen around Big Moose Lake. Multiple vacationers and residents witnessed what appeared to be a woman drowning, but some have also reported seeing a spirit wandering around the lake shore or visiting the small cottages and settlements nearby. Had justice been served? Perhaps not enough to satisfy the restless spirit of Grace Brown.